This unclean spirit that gone out of the man said, I will go back into my house from whence I came out. He made a definite decision and carried it out. And likewise, in Mark chapter 5, verses 11 through 13, we find that the evil spirits in the Gadarene demoniac had a very intense desire not to go out of that particular area of the country and to be allowed to go into the swine. So they exercised a very strong will. The pressure of their will was brought to bear upon Jesus. And this is true. They have willpower. Secondly, they have emotion and very strong emotion too. This is very vividly illustrated in James chapter 2 and verse 19. James chapter 2 verse 19. James is speaking about the fact that it's useless to have faith without works. And he applies this by illustration to evil spirits. He says, Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The demons also believe and tremble. And trembling is the manifestation of very intense emotion. And this I have seen and experienced many, many times, that demons still tremble. When they're brought out into the open and confronted with the name and the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, you will frequently see people start to tremble violently. It's not the person that's trembling. It's the evil spirit in the person that's trembling. And it always does me good to see them tremble at the name of Jesus. We had a meeting in this very room about two weeks ago on a Thursday morning. And the Spirit of God moved into this room and one after another the people in various parts of the room started to tremble and shake violently. No one was preaching at them and I could hardly move around the room quick enough to get to the people. You see the demons had been stirred up by the message which I had preached was on the power of the blood of Jesus and they could no longer remain dormant. I've heard my brother in the Lord Don Basham say that it's somewhat like going off to birds with dogs. When the bird dog gets to a certain degree of proximity, the birds get scared and rise up and fly out and reveal their presence. And that's the time you get a chance to shoot them. And this is really true. I've been in various meetings where the demons have started to fly up, as it were, almost in a covey and just manifest themselves wholesale because they get so scared, see? They're scared by the word of God and the authority of the name of Jesus and the fact that their identity is being laid bare. As a matter of fact, it's happened in several occasions that when I've started to cast a spirit out of one person and name the spirit, every other person who had that spirit in the room started to be delivered at the same time. I was uh, in some meetings in Greensburg in Pennsylvania and a woman said, I believe I have a spirit of criticism. And I said, you spirit of criticism come out of this woman. About four people started to cough all around. So that shows you what the problem with the church is. <laughs> so here we have this second evidence of personality. They have emotion. Thirdly, they have knowledge. They know a lot. In fact, they know a lot more than some Christians. In Mark chapter 1, you find this illustrated in the incident of the um, man in the synagogue in Capernaum. Mark 1, 23 and 24, there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, in an unclean spirit, and he cried out saying, let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. That man had probably never seen Jesus before. Not one of his disciples had yet recognized his identity. Not one of the human beings of his own generation knew who he was, but the evil spirit in that man knew immediately he was the Holy One of God. The same is also illustrated in Acts 19, which is a real lively incident I'd like to read to you. Acts 19, uh, and I think we start at verse 13, yes. Then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preached. As I pointed out in my previous study, the Jewish people practiced exorcism in the time of Jesus. They recognized evil spirits and tried to deal with them in various different ways, as many of the heathen do, the Muslims do today, for instance. So having found out that Paul got 
remarkable results by using the name of Jesus, these unconverted Jews decided they'd use the name of Jesus too. And so they spoke to this man who had an evil spirit, and they say, we adjure you by Jesus, whom Paul preaches. And it says, verse 14, there were seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew, and chief of the priests, which did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are ye? And they must have had, I suppose, the shock of their lives. <laughs> Furthermore, the language isn't, isn't uh, accurately represented in the King James Version because two different words for know are used. Jesus I acknowledge, and Paul I know about. I've heard about this man, Paul. He's creating a lot of problems for us. That's what he was saying in effect. Jesus I acknowledge, I know who he is, the Holy One of God. Paul I know about. We've heard enough about him. He's creating trouble for us in this whole area of Ephesus. But you see that they, they knew a lot. And there are other instances. For instance, we don't need to look there, but in the 16th chapter of Acts, the damsel with the spirit of divination knew that Paul and Silas were the preachers of the gospel, the servants of the Most High God, long before the people of Philippi realized who they were. Then again, demons have self-awareness. They're aware of themselves. Just take one example here. In Mark 5, verse 9, again, this is the incident of the Gadarene demoniac. Jesus asked him, what is thy name? He spoke to the spirit and said, what is thy name? And he, the spirit, answered saying, my name is Legion, which is a group of about 6,000 soldiers, for we are many. So not only did he know himself, but he knew of the other spirits that were present there, and they knew their approximate number and so on, which is what I would call evidence of self-awareness. Then again, demons have a conscience which is another mark of personality. This is stated in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2. We'll read verse 1 to get the context. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Now the Spirit, that is the Holy Spirit, speaketh expressly that in the latter times, towards the close of this age, some believers shall depart from the faith, the Christian faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. The second verse says, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Now the Greek is absolutely definitive. Those phrases do not apply to the people who depart from the faith, but to the demons that deceive them. It's the demons that speak lies in hypocrisy. It's the demons that have their consciences seared with a hot iron. So a demon has a conscience, but it has been so seared that it is useless to appeal to it. It will never respond to the dictates of its conscience. Finally, as has already been indicated, demons have the ability to speak. Uh, we do not need to turn to the references given there in your outline, but it refers to the incident of the man in the synagogue who spoke out and challenged Jesus to the Gadarene demoniac, where Jesus carried on some kind of a conversation with the spirits in that man, and to the case in Ephesus in Acts 19, where the Spirit spoke out of the man and said, Jesus I acknowledge and Paul I know about, but who are ye? So to sum it up, we would say this, that the scripture indicates that evil spirits have the following attributes of personality. Will, emotion, knowledge, self-awareness, conscience, and the ability to speak. And that, without a question, compels us to classify them as persons. They are persons without bodies. Now let's look in Matthew 12 just for a moment and observe one fact there. Matthew chapter 12 verses 24 through 28. Jesus has just delivered a man of an evil spirit the man had been blind and dumb. After deliverance, he was able both to speak and to see. And verse 23, all the people were amazed and said, Is not this the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow doth not cast out demons, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the demons. And Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself, how shall then his kingdom stand? And if I, by Beelzebub, cast out demons, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, 
then the kingdom of God is come unto you. Both the Pharisees and Jesus give to Satan the title Beelzebub in special relationship to demons. Now Beelzebub means literally Lord of Flies. There is a modern novel with that title. I imagine many people who read it don't realize that it's a translation of the word Beelzebub. And this is particularly Satan's title as the ruler over demons because the demons are compared by analogy to the insect world, which is a very a vivid and accurate analogy in many ways because there are myriads, uncountable myriads of demons and they harass, they defile, they even bring death and yet often we're not aware of their presence or activity or even when we're aware that something is wrong we're not aware of what produces it. For instance, to take the example of malaria, it's produced by the female of the species Anopheles, the mosquito, and for many, many generations, Africans suffered from malaria, attributing it to all sorts of things like bad water and so on, quite unaware of the real cause. And as a matter of fact, you can have an Anopheles mosquito in your room and it can bite you, sting you, and create the uh, infection of malaria. You'd never be aware that anything had happened. And this is uh, typical of the activity of demons. They act in a certain sense under cover. Often we don't realize that they're there, and even when we see something wrong, we don't know the real cause of it. And so, in Bible language, Satan is lord of the flies, he's lord of the insect world as the ruler over the demons. He rules over two kingdoms. In the heavenlies, he rules over fallen angels, and on earth, he rules over evil spirits. But this is particularly his title as the ruler over the evil spirits. Now let's consider some of the main activities of demons. And I've suggested that you can sum them up conveniently by taking certain fairly common verbs in the English language and considering these verbs. I have listed a number of verbs there. The first one is to entice. This is one of the activities of evil spirits. They entice human beings to do wrong. They make evil appear attractive. They set a bait for human souls. This is referred to in James chapter 1 verse 14, speaking about the mechanism of temptation. James 1 14, every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and entice. Notice there are two factors in temptation. There's something in the man that's perverted. A perverted evil desire, which is called lust. But there's something from without that plays upon this thing within. Because enticing is always used of an agent who operates to ensnare a creature. So the evil spirit from without presents to the lust within something to entice that person into sin. This is one of the common activities of demons. It's enticement. And I suppose few of us have not experienced this in a kind of verbal form in our minds. At least, I'll be honest with you, many, many times I've heard phrases in my mind, go on, why shouldn't you do it? There's no harm in it. Uh, whatever it might be. And uh, I've also been aware many, many times that my eyes are almost being compelled to turn in a certain direction. And I know even in advance that if I turn my eyes in that direction, I'll see something that will appeal to the unclean and defiling elements inside me. This is the process of temptation. If there were no lust in me, the demon would have nothing to play upon. But the lust wouldn't be stirred up if it weren't for the demon playing upon it. So there's the combination of the, the lust inside me or you and the agent outside that puts this in front, like putting the little morsel of cheese in the mouse trap to get the mouse in there. And we have to realize that we are dealing with an agent that's intelligent, that studies us, that knows our weakness, that knows what kind of cheese we like best, that knows the very best way to get us into the trap. And the kind of enticement that Satan might use for me might not work for you. 
And I will tell you that I never really go to preach a message that's going to do the devil any damage without having my mind assailed before I preach on all sorts of irrelevances or impurities or distractions, some kind to get me off to hinder my ability to present the truth. And I know from experience that the devil knows just exactly the best ways to reach Brother Prince. They might not work with you, but he's used them so often with me that he knows pretty well how to get me. But praise the Lord, I've also learned pretty well how not to let him get me. That's the other side to it. I don't say I'm 100% victorious, but he finds it much harder than he did 15 years ago, believe me. A second main activity of evil spirits is to deceive. In 1 Timothy 4, 1, we've already seen this, but it's good to look at it again. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, Now the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, speaketh expressly that in the latter times, the close of the age, some believers shall depart from the Christian faith. These are not unbelievers, these are believers. Giving heed to seducing or deceiving spirits, and to the doctrines of demons. How do these demons seduce people from their loyalty to Jesus Christ and to the truth of the gospel? By erroneous doctrines which they put before these people. I dealt with a young man once, years back, who was gloriously saved through street meetings that we held in London. And he was a, he was a model convert. I remember he got saved on Sunday night, got the baptism of the Spirit on Tuesday night, and was prophesying by, th prophesying by Thursday night. And in those days, it didn't happen that fast. Today, we're quite familiar with this type of thing. And yet, after a while, that young man went off. And he began to tell me that there was a voice speaking to him and insinuating certain teachings into his mind. And these teachings were precisely the teachings of Christian science. And yet I questioned him, and he said he'd never read Christian science and never had any contact with it. So there was this Christian science demon perched on his shoulder, insinuating these doctrines into his mind. And this tactic of the enemy worked. He got off. He never really became an, an effective, stable, victorious Christian. And I could hardly believe it, because I was so ignorant in those days of the operations of demons, I could hardly believe that this Christian science demon could come straight to him, not through a book or through a sermon, and just begin to insinuate these deceptive doctrines into his mind. Of course, normally they'll operate through a book or through a sermon of false teaching or something like that. Another obvious result of demon activity is enslavement. Let's look in Romans 8. 15. Paul is speaking to Christians, baptized in the Holy Spirit, and he says, Ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. The spirit of bondage, bondage means enslavement. He's warning them, don't let the devil get you back into slavery. And the suggestion is very clear that the form of slavery they would be enticed back into would be that of religious slavery, subservience to the law when they'd been delivered from the law. And as a matter of fact, practically the whole of Galatians deals with this very issue of not being enslaved by religious legalism after you've once been set free by the gospel and the power of the Holy Spirit. And as a matter of fact, Paul deals with that as a much more severe and dangerous situation than he does with sexual sin like fornication or adultery. It's quite remarkable that the epistle to the Galatians is the only one that Paul doesn't begin by thanking God for the people he's writing to. He's got so upset by what they're doing that he launches straight into his subject. I marvel that he are so soon turned away from the grace of God. Here is an example of religious demons bringing people back into slavery, which is legalism. And in the fifth chapter of Galatians, you remember, he says, Be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage, of slavery. Demons enslave. The next activity which I find so common with demons is to torment. Perhaps this is the most distinctive of all their activities. Second Timothy chapter 1, Paul says, God hath not given us the spirit of fear. 
there is a spirit, a demon of fear. And in 1 John 4, 18, John points out the mark of this demon of fear. He says, fear hath torment. Now, there are many kinds of fear which are good. The fear of the Lord is clean and enduring forever, but there's a demonic fear which is tormenting. And I would say probably one out of five Christians has undergone some kind of torment from the spirit of fear. Then another obvious activity of demons is that they drive or compel. If you want to take an adjective, the adjective would be compulsive. Compulsive eating, compulsive drinking, compulsive talking. Anything that's compulsive, unnaturally and unreasonably compulsive, in my opinion, is demonic. Uh, let's look in Luke for a moment for a picture there. Luke chapter 8, verse 29. Speaking about this Gadarene demoniac again and the spirit in him, it says, oftentimes it had caught him. And he was kept bound with chains and in fetters, and he brake the bands and was driven of the devil, the demon, into the wilderness. Anything that drives you, pushes you, compels you, is demonic, in my opinion. If it's unnatural, intense, and persistent, and it's very often religious. I know of a brother in the Lord that had a demon that impelled him to testify. That would sound strange, but he just had no rest. He could not stop testifying. And in actual fact, it came to the point where he had a physical pain in his chest. And ultimately, it was identified as a demon and cast out of him. You could say, well, that's very good to be testifying all the time. Not if it's compulsive. If there's no rest in it, it's not of God. And there are... Oh, so many forms of compulsion that people are subjected to. Mental compulsion, compulsion of appetite, compulsion of speech. I know, and I say it with regret, but I realize that before I was converted, I had a demon that compelled me to blaspheme. I could not help it. I didn't want to. It just continually came out of me. Then another common mark of demon activity is defilement. Titus 1 15. Titus chapter 1 and verse 15. Unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. There are many people who have a mind and a conscience that's defiled by demon activity. I received a letter this week from a woman in another part of this country. A sincere Christian woman trying to lead a good life, trying to be a mother to her children and a wife to her husband. But she said, I have no control over my thoughts. The most awful, obscene, unclean images and suggestions continually present themselves to my mind. Now, she did not desire them. She hated them. But she could not get free from them. And I would say that I receive letters or calls for help like that frequently. Let's pause for a moment and then sum up these different verbs that present the activity of evil spirits. They entice, they deceive, they enslave, they torment, they drive or compel, and they defile. Summing this up, you can say this, that demons fight against peace in every aspect. And I have suggested in your outline certain of the obvious ways in which they fight against peace. First of all, they prevent inner personal harmony. The more I preach, the more important I see this concept of harmony. It's really part of the meaning of the word for peace. And I found comparatively few people have real inner harmony. They are not at peace with themselves. And if you're not at peace with yourself, you don't have much peace because you've got yourself with you all the time. There is not that real inner adjustment. They can never totally relax. Any person that can totally relax, in my opinion, doesn't have much of a problem with evil spirits. But there aren't many people in America today that know how to relax. 
Secondly, they take away peace of mind. They invade our thoughts. They bombard us with all sorts of suggestions, doubts, fears, lies, insinuations, accusation, condemnation. Thirdly, they attack our physical well-being. You see, the total word peace includes physical well-being. And Satan is a murderer. If he can, he'll kill us physically. Fourthly, they attack our harmonious relationships with other people, especially those who are closest to us. This is one of their main areas of activity, is inside homes and families and marriages. Jesus said, if two of you shall harmonize together on anything that, touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them. If we can get to that place of harmony with one other person, our prayers are irresistible. But my experience is comparatively few people do harmonize with the persons they live closest to. And one of the main reasons for this lack of harmony is the activity of evil spirits inside homes, marriages, families, and so on. It's no accident that my wife has learned to be very careful with me when I'm on my way to preach. In fact, I should say my whole family has. Because it's just at that moment that one wrong word or one word misunderstood can just break that harmony which is necessary for the proper presentation of the Word of God. You see, if I don't have peace, I cannot transmit peace to others. I can preach about peace, theorize about peace, but I cannot transmit what I don't have. And many, many times when you listen to a preacher, you aren't really listening to his words. You're in touch with a spirit. He may have sound doctrine, it may sound very good, but if it doesn't come out of the inner experience, it's not going to achieve anything. At least if it achieves anything, it'll not be the right thing. And then there's also, they fight against our adjustment to our circumstances and situations. A person that has evil spirits finds it hard to produce the maximum of his ability in his job, wherever it may be. They'll distract you. You start to do one thing and end up by doing three other things and forget what you were starting to do. You don't realize that. But that's the activity of evil spirits. God just very recently showed me that I had been tormented for years by a demon of distraction. It's an extraordinary thing. If I start to get a message ready, I have to get up and do about three other things and go around and sit down in my chair again. And I, it's taken me something like 30 years to nail that one and see that it's not normal, it's not natural, it's not a habit pattern, it's an enemy. All right, let's close this. The great distinctive mark of demons, in my opinion, is restlessness. Show me a restless person and I'll show you a person that needs deliverance. And I see a lot of them every day. Show me a person that's completely at rest. I cannot believe they need much deliverance. All right, there are two main points from which demons operate. We'll deal with it very, very simply. I don't have a lot of complicated theology. They may operate from outside the body or from inside the body. I don't care about a lot of distinctions between oppression and obsession and all these other things. If people want to go in for them, they're welcome. But I've learned the basic question, is it from outside or is it from inside? And if it's inside, there's one solution, get it out. Whatever label you like to give the activity, the answer is get rid of it. And that's what I close by saying. If demons are operating from outside, then we merely have to resist them, keep them out, drive them away. But if they're operating from within, the only permanent solution is to cast them out, to expel them, to get rid of them. And in my personal experience, I've discovered that if the problem is persistent, recurrent, and does not yield to ordinary forms of Christian discipline, you can be sure 99% the problem is inside and the solution is to get it out.